Todd. All right, we are recording. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Al Rashid. I am from the Washington DC VMUG chapter. With us today, we have Paul Brern. He's an advisory systems engineer with Dell Technologies. The topic of his discussion is Tinkertry Home Labs VMware vSphere 7 upgrade challenges, successes, and lessons learned. At different breaks, I'll go ahead and pause because I want to keep this conversational, uh, informal. And a lot of what I'm doing with the demos, I really want to open up to conversation to hear your experiences with vSphere 7. Page one. All right, let's move the thumbnails off to the side. Awesome. So yeah, you already heard the title. Um, just a little bit of background here. I live less than two hours from Boston in New York, right here in Weathersfield, Connecticut. So it's a pretty convenient location because a lot of my uh, career has involved customers in Boston and New York and everywhere in between and all over New England and a bit of New Jersey. This past summer, I was actually driving to DC a whole lot. I got some pictures coming up, but it's awesome to be here today. Thanks to Al. Al and I meeting at a, another user group where we got to talking a little bit um, about careers and so forth. And that's the, the awesome thing that's missing from an online experience, the face-to-face -face stuff. And today we're going to do our best to substitute. And I even have props and two cameras set up. I want to have a little fun and make this as you know, live and interactive as possible. All right, bottom right corner, I'll just point out the expert. Many of you are in that program. I would strongly uh, encourage it, if you, especially if you spend some time giving back to the community, like giving presentations like this. And then finally, VCP2681, just kind of dating myself there, but there's a little um, cer certification there uh, where you took the class and you passed the test. That was for an eight-month um, pharmaceutical right here in Connecticut where they really needed VCP. And I was working for uh, IBM at the time, and it was a, a pretty good case for eight months of professional services before you were allowed to touch a keyboard you needed your vcp and that's how i got started with the vcp program all of you have different stories and career paths but i'll just point out tinkertry.com my personal blog is what has me here today this is going to have very little to do with my day job and i just want to point that out so the stuff i'm talking about here's my disclaimer this is me as a content creator here at tinkertry.com talking today and i want to point out i've been using vsphere since the 2.5 days regularly, deploying it at a Fortune 50 company way back in 2005, for instance, all major .0 releases have issues of any product in the software industry. So today we're going to be talking about some of those rough edges. My point is the spirit of constructive um, you know, feedback and helping each other. That's the point of a VMUG, giving each other tips and techniques to get past some uh, minor issues. You could call them um, bugs or um, challenges, whatever you want to, euphemism you want to use. But uh, ultimately, we like helping each other, and forums, videos, talking on VMUGs like this is a great way to do that. And I quite enjoy it. And you're going to get a little background about me. You already saw the description. You guys click sign up, so you don't need to read that again. But yes, we are going to cover almost all of this. Some of the more fine nuances, we might run out of time. If you see something here like, oh, can I see your battery and how you shut that down? Or if we don't end up covering all this, that's fine. Just catch up with this slide three and circle back and ask, because we'll have plenty of pauses for questions where you guys can guide what I'm going to be talking about. That's absolutely fine. The deck is not meant to be uh, everything. It's got probably 70 or 80% of what I want to talk about. All right, here's the overview. Those are the major bullets of what I'll be talking about. And you'll notice demo is right in the middle. That's going to be in like pretty soon. I'm going to actually jump into my home lab at numerous points to illustrate various points I'm making. But first, kind of what makes me tick where I come from, that background will kind of help explain why I started Tinker Try nine years ago. And that I'll explain the who, what, when, where, and why of having a home lab. Finally, the value, obviously, is finding things in vSphere 7, for instance, before you go do the, say, vSphere 7 update 1 over in your production environment, because many of you are IT professional professionals. So let's move along here next to some logos. So I go way back to the 90s. Um, many of you do, too. Uh, help desk is a pretty common thing. There's a fun tweet um, yesterday from Matt Broberg asking people what their career path was. Mine wasn't exactly typical. Um, data entry at a dress shop in my teens, uh, data entry for an insurance company, moving along to a uh, help desk at a large university, and then finally helping out IBM contract work and then becoming an IBMer for 21 years, moving over to VMware for two and a half years, finally a small HCI vendor called Pivot3 that had me in the federal space again. I had secret clearance as an IBMer, so I spent quite a bit of time in the DC area back then. And then finally, uh, last summer, driving all over the place, covering 25,000 miles, including many trips to the DC area. And then most recently, since October, at Dell Technology. So that's my career arc. Most of this is post-sales, hands-on, rack-and-stack kind of stuff. Only the last three and a half years are pre-sales. 
So each of us, uh, again, has a completely different story. That's my path. So a lot of these jobs were pretty grueling, like many folks, you know, 50, 60 hours a week. And for the last seven years I was at IBM doing storage support, I was on call. So I know what it's like to have, you know, basically beeper duty, right? And to have a, a phone that's got to be near you at all points in time, including when the phone rings, you tend to be on for 10, 20 hours to get things going again. So just pointing that background out. And then a career turn here happened for me in 2015, where I got to help with a red book. So if any of you are familiar with red books and Lenovo has them and Dell has something similar. So basically writing the instruction manual for a new product. So when vSphere 6 was coming out, in 2014, the beta code was in a lab and they got me signed up for the IBM developer program where I had closer ties to VMware than I did as a VMware employee. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I had access to daily drops of the code with no release notes. You were basically just winging it. So I'm, my point in telling you that story is that was a big career moment where my youngest had just gone off to college, literally Monday, getting back from that sad trip of leaving him off. I get an email saying, you want to spend a month in Germany and we'll pay for it. And you, the catch is you're helping write a red book while you're there. So I was kind of the lab monkey as well as writing some of the words in this document. So that's where taking the blogging that I've been doing for four years at that point into a public realm and into my day job kind of crossed over. That led to, um, you know, all good things for me. And here's summing up my current me and all my passions on the side. First and foremost, a dad of two sons. One's in Pittsburgh, one's in Cambridge. They're in their 20s, gainfully employed, thankfully, in these difficult times. And uh, travel's been a challenge for all of us. Um, and cars, not planes. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, let's move along here. Just mention right here. This one means something to me. All the EV home. Remember I mentioned I drove 25,000 miles last year? Well, efficiency has been in my title of Tinker Tries tagline for um, almost since the beginning. I think I refined it in 2013 was the last time I touched it. So that's my point when I share this with you. The most efficient car in the country is what I'm now driving after almost 30 years of Honda Civic. So I'll just point out, this was a huge thing in my family to dump all gasoline in our garage and be able to get to DC and back or each way for about $14 electricity. It was a huge thing and a, and a big risk, frankly, when I took it late in late 20, 2018. And then finally, my wife was so fond of driving my car that she replaced her Honda Civic with a $38,000 lowest cost Tesla that gets her to and from work and that drives around the, the state as a nurse. So I couldn't be happier about that tech purchase. It has had a bigger impact on carbon footprint for my website than all other eight years of blogging combined about efficient servers. And that feels kind of good. Um, less carbon footprint, right? And I do drive a lot for work in the past until recently, like most of you. All right. Nobody needs to take notes here. Everything will be available here. This uh, bit.ly URL. And let me just put that in the chat. Whoops. And I'm going to um, pause for just a moment to work on getting that in the clipboard. And over in the Zoom, just one moment, I see a couple of chats, so I just want to see if there's something urgent. All right, cool. We've got a bunch of people on chat. Just folks saying hi. All right, great. There's the link is where the notes will be. It doesn't look like it hyperlinked it, so let me get you the full URL. There you go. That'll be up by 4.30 today. All right, moving back along here. Before we continue, a quick sound check and a test of are we have any problems with audio? So, okay, sorry, I'm looking for my audio control panel to unmute everyone. And that's over on the participants list. All right, a quick unmute. Everyone doing okay with the video and the audio? I've got everybody unmuted now. All right, I'm going to go back to muting since someone's uh, an open mic there. All right, back to mute all. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, hit me on the chat. If, okay, good. Sound is fine. Thank you for the sound check on the chat. Awesome. Let's move along. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me, since this deck is going on the VMUG uh, forum, I believe, uh, Al indicated, you kind of can't put email in there. So don't feel bad about that. Just contact me at tinkertry.com slash Tesla. Uh, slash contact and all the links are inside of there uh, and you'll see a way to email and so forth no problem or follow me on twitter and so forth all right many reasons for home labs so don't worry you came here for a vSphere 7 what's new presentation a technical fairly deep dive into some of the little um hiccups i ran into along the way don't worry we're going to get to that but i still think it's kind of important to have a sense of why i have a home lab what my home lab looks like and why i set out to use it 
uh, when I was trying to get rid of my half rack of uh, hand-me-down gear a good five, six years ago. Uh, around the time when I was running into some, um, well, some health issues and, uh, well, if you've heard the word hernia, you don't really want to be listing, lifting 200-pound stuff anymore. <laughs> uh, I did get that repaired, but nevertheless, it kind of had me in a mindset of, I got to clean 1,000 pounds of junk out of my basement, get it over to the you know, responsible recycling, and move on with life and not have to worry about that someday. So that's me. But many of you just got started because you wanted your VCP, frankly, and you went and bought maybe an Intel Nook, you know, the bare minimum of six or $700 investment to squeak by with what's barely sufficient to run a vSphere uh, 7 cluster these days. I, I throw the most common one there, and that's the VCP, right? So I'm sure many of you can relate to going that angle. But for me, it was more, I want to get hardware and software left running in my home lab. And to my delight, the VMUG organization, thanks to Brad Tompkins over there, uh, to help in the Connecticut VMUG, uh, which has struggled because we're right between Boston and New York from time to time, to get up attendance, he actually funded giving away a server with the eval experience uh, software uh, stack. That's quite a bundle. So hardware and software to help spur attendance. I hear one mic. Is that you, Al? Okay, I hit mute again, and we're all good. Someone who joined. All right. Um, maybe I got that wrong, but we're set now. It's quiet. Al, you're also a co-leader. You can talk as well at any time, right? I can. You're Great. fine, though. I believe I'm going to repeat. If someone enters at this time, they come in as unmuted, so we just got to keep that in mind. Yeah, so I'll need to keep an eye on it. Thank you, Al. Great. All right, so next. When would you get a home lab? Well, most of you probably wouldn't already have one at this point, right? Um, anytime you have an inclination or budget. My take on it was it takes so darn long to boot a cluster, especially multi-nodes. Not really a fan of that. Finally, I just wanted something that was low enough watts, like in the 30, 40 watts at idle range, where I could leave it running. That actually came in handy for folding at home. Um, we'll get into that, where I could leave multiple nodes up and crank them up at night and so forth. All right. Um, by the way, if you haven't heard of vExpert already, you probably have, but that's more of an advocacy program where you're giving back to the community, giving presentations or producing content. Strongly encourage you to go there, uh, including once you're logged in, you have access to an amazing amount of VMware code, including all the ISOs and point releases. So it's a very rich program for access to a lot of perks and benefits, including access to vSphere code. And I know some of you might have logins for username and work, password for work, but that doesn't mean you can open a trouble ticket. We're going to talk about trouble tickets and, and, and all that in a little bit, but access to the code for home lab, you know, legitimate use, there are multiple paths. Another way is this way. And yes, this looks like a bit of an ad, but I couldn't be more proud than to have the VMUG organization uh, giving readers 10% off and stay tuned. Um, watch carefully for what might happen September 1st. So you heard it here first. That has not been tweeted out. Keep an eye on this uh, September 1st. You might find some extra value in the program coming your way if you were kind of on the edge of signing up for eval experience to also get access to code. Okay, let's move along here. Notice what I'm saying here. Even if you're back level, don't worry. Got your back, the community. So. This is kind of cool. Um, this article is embarrassingly popular, uh, easy update to ESXi. It, it basically, these images in my PDF deck I'll be giving out to publish, they're all lickable. So you click the image and it, boom, it brings up the article I'm talking about or the tweet I'm showing. Okay, so I just want to point that out. So again, no need to take notes. That one URL I threw in the chat at the beginning, the bit.ly link, is all you'll need for the entire deck, including all the links and stuff I'll be showing you today. Um, my point here is whatever program you're in, VMUG uh, or VExpert, or if you're a little back level on the code, even if you don't have a VCSA appliance installed, you can actually update to the latest hypervisor, even move from 6.7 to 7.0, all with a click of the mouse. Let me turn off the mouse wheel. There we go. Sorry. There we go. That's better. So this article, I misspoke. It's not a click of the mouse. It's an SSH session. So we're talking about ESX CLI. You SSH in. And you cut and paste the command and literally move into 7.0 update B right there. It's as simple as putting this whole thing in your clipboard and pasting it. Now, my article is much more detailed than that, of course, warning you, back it up first. I even have a way to clone your hypervisor. Because if you're in a home lab, you may be on hardware that's not even supported. You may have no ability to open a trouble ticket because that costs money generally. So you got your uh, own self to blame if you don't back up your hypervisor first, especially if it's on USB, you can trivially clone that USB drive before messing with moving from 6.7 to 7.0, and then rollback is as easy as sticking the old USB drive in and booting from that and you're back where you were. So I just want to point out, read the whole article, 
including all the gotchas and the detailed steps, especially for your first run. But this article has enjoyed um, embarrassing success. I wish it was easier built right into ESXi host client uh, for folks to just update with the GUI. But for now, at least we have a universal way that seems to work for including me when I've had trouble with using Update Manager in the past, now called Lifecycle Manager. If that's giving me any trouble or the appliance is on the wrong system that I've powered off or whatever, I could just go to the SSH shell, uh, ESXi, and get it done. So, all right. Um, and the point here is you don't have to be back level anymore. You're not a second class citizen in your home lab. You're at the bleeding edge testing the latest gear, which is probably kind of the point, right? So that's the point of this article. You can get to the very latest, even if you don't have a legitimate, you know, uh, full way to get support should you run into troubles when you go to upgrade. All right. We already talked about some of the reasons and the big pivot for many people probably around a decade ago, and especially the dawn of NVMe drives in the last five years. Oh my gosh, SATA SSDs are not good, especially on VMware Workstation on a laptop with maybe eight or 16 gig of RAM, 32 gig if you're really lucky. The SATA SSD till chokes the whole experience. Try to boot two VMs on that. They don't take twice as long. They take like five times as long. It's terrible. NVMe drives, you know, gum sticks, so much better. So that was me. Five years ago, ready to dedicate a workstation to running the hypervisor, forgetting about leaving workstation in my rear view mirror. I still run it on my laptop from time to time, especially when I was traveling uh, with federal sites with no internet. So VMware Workstation, awesome for that, but for everything else, I have a hypervisor running in my home and a VPN to get to it, of course. All right, philosophically, here's why I write. You can read that later if you feel like it. I know you wanted me to start showing you stuff in a GUI. So I'm gonna blow right past this, but basically just say, I document things for myself, and then I read it years later to help myself, the future version of myself. And uh, you know, I, I enjoy doing that because I learn by getting stuff out of my brain into words on a blog. That's not for everyone, but for me, that helps me learn. A Couple of quick tips before we get into showing you around the lab. This was a huge thing for me, to have a small router that could go on the road when I traveled and used to bring the whole cluster up at local VMUGs. I would stick it in my car and drive off, or even fly around with it. Having a router with me do DHCP, DNS, forward and reverse lookups was awesome. I didn't have to wait for Active Directory or Windows Server, which I don't even have MSDN anymore. So now that it is on VCSA Appliance, it's really nice to have your router do your DHCP reservations ideally, and then also forward and reverse lookups for DNS. This has been a huge boon for me. And they started like uh, around 100 from 29, but I think it's worth the boat bump up to the faster one where this thing will handle even up to 3.4 million packets per second. And I have Cox Communications Gigablast here in Connecticut. Realistically, I get more like six or 700 megabits down. This router can easily handle that. All the routers that your internet provider will give you, pretty darn rare that any of them will come anywhere close to keeping up with a DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem these days. They tend to hamper your performance that you're paying for on a monthly basis. So for me, wi is from Eero in bridge mode where they're all wired backhaul to my network. So that's just providing me Wi-Fi, but DNS, DHCP, routing is all through my router. So that's the combo that's worked really well for me. I have a very flat, simple network. I know that's not everyone, and you might be jumping up and down. Why aren't you using VLANs and isolating it? Well, guess what? Because I need access to my VMs, I'm actually using one right now. This Windows 10 machine you're looking at is a VM. It's not a physical machine. I'm routing my keyboard and mouse to it through over IP. I'm routing my 4K Brio webcam over to it over IP. So my primary workstation is my vSphere 7 data center. That's nuts <laughs> and not highly recommended. It's a kind of experimental, but it keeps me at the bleeding edge, keeps me finding any little bugs that crop up. And here's another little tip for you to feel a little more like, uh, if you didn't learn anything else today, hopefully you uh, enjoy this little tip if you didn't discover this already. If you're using Chrome on a PC, pretty slick to basically appify your vSphere client and save yourself a whole lot of visual real estate and pop-ups and X's through your certificate and all that. And actually, I've got another article talking about how to clear the certificate warnings. It takes all of like 20 seconds. Um, not all of you are the same, where your kind of attention to detail can drive you nuts. So when you log into, say, a hands-on lab and you see the certificate warning, you can actually fix that in 20 seconds by downloading the cert and adding it to your trusted cert uh, in Windows. And then boom, your browser and your lab immediately goes away with the warning. I love those little tricks. They just help you sleep better at night when your lab looks clean, when you're doing training videos and such. I always find it kind of annoying to see this kind of stuff. That's just me. Not everyone's like that, I know. It's a curse too, in a way. All right. Um, quick look at hardware before we get back into the software bugs. The hardware platform for me was one that's on the VM VMware vSphere compatibility list. So that's important if you want to open a trouble ticket. 
And it was still there until 6.7. That's why over here, it's not advertising 7.0. Supermicro is still working on that. With Wired Zone, that's a tricky spot. When a 7.0 came out in April 2nd, I tried opening a ticket just a week later. There was almost nothing on the VMware compatibility list for 7.0. You're pretty much in trouble to try to open a trouble ticket unless your server was on the 7.0 list. So just pointing out that stark reality. For me, if I was going to spend three or four, about two to three grand when I started out on this in 20... 15 prototypes in the 2016 where it went, you know, wide and um, shipped in, in volume. Um, I didn't want to lose all that investment and not be able to open a ticket should I have trouble. And I've actually bought a legitimate copy of vSphere because I run some semi kind of production workloads in my home lab. So anyhow, um, yeah, this is a white box that doesn't even come with labels. So I made stickers for folks so they can actually figure out what plugs into what, what's 10 gig and what's one gig. Now, to dwell on that, but I want to point there's many other operating systems you can run, and it's obviously kind of useful to have a motherboard that's very efficient but has 10 gig on there and only burns something like 38 watts at idle. So ZMD has been a huge boon, and luckily AMD with their Epic platform has some interesting stuff coming up soon to help um, compete in this market space, this edge, net, edge or IoT, whatever you want to call it. I think it's wonderful there's more competitors joining that market of a nice compact motherboard that's all of 6.7 inch square. More to come, hopefully by 2021. All right, just a brief thought here too. I'm always thinking about, as I present today, and I want to unmute frequently, if you guys have ideas for the future, stuff you'd like to see in your home, maybe your uh, daughter or son sleeps in the bedroom where your server is, so then you'd like a fanless design. Um, maybe you don't care about 3.5 inch drives that spin anymore and you just want to go all NVMe. Everyone has different needs and, and thoughts. Um, if you're trying to go all premium, you know, Optane only or something, well, now you're getting to four or five grand and you're excluding a whole lot of folks. So the stuff I blog about tends to start around $1,500. It's a big step up from the mobile processor that's in Intel Nooks. It's to a proper server that has out-of-band IPMI without any licensing attached. So I'll just point out those are kind of my prereqs for how I have home lab stuff. And then finally, uh, this would be kind of a, a dream I've had <laughs> for many years. Wouldn't it be great if there was a starter four node in one chassis for things like VSAN or even VxRail at a price point, say, four figures, not five? Hopefully I, some of your ears perked up when I said that. That would be awesome. That's very difficult to achieve. Um, it's kind of expensive to have a home lab to test vSAN properly, frankly, to have at least four nodes. Not the most realistic thing for most folks. Plus, you got the noise of a 10 gig switch. So here's a switch I did not buy, but got reviewed. Kind of interesting when you get a fanless servers are starting to come around and maybe fanless 10 gig. This could get interesting to leave a server upstairs. Maybe you don't have a basement because you live in the southern part of the USA. I'm aware of that. A lot of people return one year units because they're not happy with noise. Here's my 10 gig switch from four years ago. Haven't, um, I've updated the firmware on it, but that's about it. Can't go trying everything under the sun. They're pretty expensive still. I was hoping the price would fall down to under 200 and here we are. Most of them are still five to 700 and up for a decent number of ports, you know, more than four ports. All right, there's my lab. Now, I'll just say this. Um, I'm gonna point to a couple of things and I definitely wanna unmute here. Yep. Unmuting is not gonna work. Let me see if I can find the hot mic. Just a second. There it is. Oh, it's whack-a-mole. One more hot mic to hit. Just a moment. Cue up your questions while I'm working on whack-a-mole looking for hot mic. <laughs> Three down. And one more to go. Got it. Four hot mics killed. All right, everyone else is unmuted. So there's my lab. As I talk, if you have any questions about anything you see, by all means, jump in. I'm gonna start at the top here. There's LED lighting. So in my basement, I've got a hung ceiling. I went ahead and replaced it with panel LED lights. Um, that was a little difficult to find with a warm color temperature that didn't make everything look ghastly and terrible on video. Um, there I went to FedEx and printed this giant banner. Got this roll of paper that goes behind my little studio where a lot of my videos are created in 4K glory. That paper in the back helps because it gets scuffed up and ruined over time. So I just pull the paper down, get a fresh roll of paper behind the camera. Down in the bottom, I've got these sliding cabinets that are on Teflon feet. The whole assembly is on Teflon feet because the whole thing weighs 500 pounds. I can easily slide around my basement floor to get behind and do cabling. So all my cables are just draped behind the back and just hidden by this cabinetry below and they're never shown on camera. So this is something I kind of had in my head for, I don't know, about a decade and finally built it two years ago. Um, and then lots of power up here that are all UPS protected. And then finally you see a tripod here. 
And it's kind of messy because I'm doing stuff. Over on the right, you hear it, see an open air, air uh, ZND 2123 with four NVMe drives and a PCIe card sticking up and a power supply off to the side. Not the prettiest thing, but that's, you know, what you do in a lab. Here's the cube server. I blurred out a little future project I'm working on where I'm always looking for what's around the bend. Back here is the UPS. Here's the Synology NAS that I use from time to time. And then finally a laptop with a secondary USB, two, uh, USB 3 display that's on a uh, Dell dock over here to the left. And just to uh, make this a little more compelling here, I want to show you. Here's a live view. Wow, it locked up. Got to unlock that. Just a moment. Let me show you a live view of the lab. Anyone have any questions about anything you're seeing with your eyeballs there? You can ask me uh, anything at all. Oh, great. Yep. I didn't open my chat in a while. Thanks. No worries. I think you already answered this, but on behalf of Denny, what are you using for your 10 gig switch? Oh, uh, yeah. I did answer that a little earlier in the deck. And that is a Netgear, or actually the previous page. There it is, ProSafe XS708T. And there you go. And that's, I think, maybe still available. I think it's been um, replaced by a slightly different version that's still around 700 ish. Not the cheapest, but it also has eight ports. That's what you're paying for. There's a lot more options in the four port world. So if you only have two nodes and they're 10 gig and maybe like a third node that's a NAS with 10 gig, you can get away with a four port 10 gig. Absolutely fine and save a lot of money there. Um, the next question from Jeff, do you add additional power receptacles or just using your UPS? Yeah, so on my workbench here, I've got a whole bunch of power up here. I have a UPS down here on a leg that you can't see in the dark, and then I have another UPS on the table that's plugged into the servers that are right on the workbench. So um, I only have like 20 minutes of power, though, and I had a massive power outage for 55 hours here in Connecticut just three weeks ago. At that point, you're not going to be getting work done anyway. But I do like having power everywhere because often my camera footage, like any busy IT pro, you don't necessarily have a time for a whole lot of cut action and retake and resituate the camera. Often I'm just doing an unboxing and plugging the thing in with a watt meter and just doing it right there and having everything handy with these boxes up top with power cords and you know NVMe adapters and everything I need like within arm's reach I could just keep the camera rolling with a lapel mic and uh, that's what works for me so I have lots of outlets here and actually on the legs of the furniture there's more outlets um, this is live video you can see the second hand moving trying to convince you that's my lab um, so I'm standing in my home office with no computers only three monitors 27 inch in front of me two 22 inches on either side flanking it that's where i do everything i remote desktop to my work laptop i keep all the noise and heat out of my office and i have a ac return a eight inch hole i board above my head to pull the heat out of this room and keep it so i can have the door closed and work comfortably for hours without you know bothering the family that's just me <laughs> the basement tends to stay colder anyway uh, and that's what you're looking at here so that's my basement where in new england we have the luxury of having a a full basement and I, I quite enjoy having control over the lighting and having no windows near this works out pretty well for me. Um, so yeah, any other questions there's SpaceX. I got to see the Falcon Heavy launch where they threw a car into space. I was there with one of my sons to witness that with my own eyes. I even got to see a shuttle as a, as a kid. So kind of have my other passions like many of you do too. Um, that's my picture on the wall. It just reminds me of a really fun experience. Well, I've got two questions before I ask them. Just a reminder if everyone could remain muted. Unfortunately, there's a limitation. Whenever someone enters the session after it's begun, they enter as unmuted. So that's why you're hearing a lot of background noise. So again, please mute, mute, mute your microphone. Uh, the next question, Paul, is from Patrick. What drives are you using in your Synology 68 complex? Okay. I'm going to answer that by bringing up the article because i got to be honest with you. I haven't touched it too recently here. And... Um, the next, I just looked ahead in the chat. The next question is pretty funny too. Someone has a really keen eye for uh, detail. All right, so here's the NAS. And actually Synology just came out with a new one today. A little weird that they still ha have you choose. You, you don't have 10 gig on all their products yet. So I'm kind of hoping they fix that. And um, I don't have an answer for you on the drives because the machine is actually probably, I think it's powered off right now. In this YouTube video I covered though, I do believe I formatted and went with iSCSI. So you'll see the drive type right in there. And the next question is about, uh, you know, Paul, what's up with the uh, Lenovo keyboard? Well, remember I worked at IBM 21 years, kind of get used to a track point. I do single precision, single pixel precision screen grabs dozens a day for web content and even for part of my day job. So I absolutely am a fan of the track point. And you can see I've overlaid a Bluetooth keyboard on top of my Dell laptop. Kind of funny, right? 
But hey, I'm at home. Normally no one's looking at me and judging me based on my keyboard choice. I do like the Lenovo keyboards, but I would say Dell laptops keyboards are awfully close. They're just missing the track point. Some of them do actually have the track point. They're corporate ones. It's just not called the track point. <laughs> Good eye, uh, Brian Geller. <laughs> nice, nice, nice eye. Any other questions folks have? Okay, I'll return to my presentation at this point. I'm going to hit mute all, or yeah, I'll hit mute all, probably for safety. Um, there we go. I'm thinking about that. It's Here's the thing. I already did whack-a-mole and muted four people, and I don't remember who they were. How about I leave it open? If we get an open mic, mic I'll just whack-a-mole at that point. I'm going to keep cruising. I would like people to be able to interrupt me and ask a question on the spot. It's fine. If it becomes untenable, I'll mute everyone if I have to. Okay, moving along here. Uh, we already covered this. Okay, bugs and workarounds. I'm going to start with the hardware, and then we'll get into vSphere 7. So this is not just vSphere 7. This is just hardware to run vSphere 7. <laughs> All right. So these are general comments where moving to one, uh, moving from one gig to ten gig hasn't been easy, has not been easy. Um, I'll point out that some Xeon D motherboards, including this particular Supermicro motherboard, but there's some Dell and other reports as well. The 10 gig ports on an X557 chip might go off. And when they go off, the only recourse, the only recovery is to de-energize the motherboard, meaning you gotta unplug the motherboard. And that's not great. Because <laughs> if you're remote and you don't have IPMI, how are you gonna do that? Now I happen to have a outlet switch on my de desk. I can actually do it remotely. And usually I'd go a month or a week or so before my 10 gig ports would go down. But that's been a problem that's been kind of a, an issue that's bit people. I'm muting another mic. There we go. Um, it's been a few, a handful of people. Not a lot. A lot of people aren't using the 10 gig ports, but that's been a bump in the road. I just say we're kind of early adopters in the world of 10 gig on integrated systems called, you know, system on a chip, where you got everything on the chip and the motherboard. This is not a PCI Razor card. So when everything's soldered on the motherboard like that, let me just point out what the machine looks like. Right here's a picture of it. Here's your 10 gig. You're not ripping that off, right? You can use a PCI slot, but you only have one. You don't really want to dedicate to that to 10 gig. You might be putting a, a GPU or four NVMe drives in there. So I'm just going to point out 10 gig's been a little bit of a bumpy road. It's not the focus of my presentation here, but if anyone who's uh, not muted or wants to unmute their own mic, has anyone done 10 gig full time in their home lab with something like a Synology NAS at the other end or two nodes in a VCN cluster? Anyone have any 10 gig stories of? Um, Success or failure, this would be a great time to unmute your mic and share it with us. Because you're, you're not alone if you had some problems. Okay. Sounds like maybe a no. So I'll move on. I think you might be playing with fire. <laughs> well, not literally. It hasn't been hot. Overheating is what some people are saying, but mine seem to have nothing to do with heat. So ultimately, they can swap out a motherboard, and later ones seem to have fixed this. That's a whole other you know, world of uh, shipping, though. Not ideal, right? You, it'd be better if you could just fix it with firmware. But this problem ended up being a little bit of uh, software, firmware, some people reporting temperatures. And unfortunately, some of the very popular SYS, five, uh, E200 and E300s that William Lamb also blogs about, the 1U, some of those are actually reporting a, occasional 10 gig network drops as well. That's a bummer, because when I first wrote this article, it didn't seem to hit those. But the problem, you know, after years of the problem, it's not actually just the mini tower form factor. It can be on one use as well, which is an identical motherboard, so it's not really a surprise. Okay, moving past the hardware, let's get into software a little more and demos. Okay, so as we cover these bullets, you're going to see a fully functional lab. And my point here by highlighting how well everything works, well, I'm doing that um, partly to show I conquered pretty much all the hurdles, right? There were minor pain points. I'm used to it. And remember my Germany um, write a red book story. I was called myself a lab rat. Yeah, I had old hardware. It had all kinds of firmware on it and ancient versions of VSXI. I was responsible for getting it all ship shape, identical versions of firmware on all nodes, and then do VVOL testing. So I had to immediately get stable DNS, DHCP, uh, rebuild ESXi, and get the BIOS and the firmware and all the drives, everything deployed best practices. So when we wrote that red book, it would come out well and people wouldn't have uh, problems and in intermittent issues. So I took that job seriously, quite enjoyed it. That background is kind of is what makes me tick. You had to come up with a solution, get it working, no matter, you know, deal with the cards that were dealt to you, and deal with bugs where I didn't even have uh, 
hardware that was currently supported for, for 6.0 because 6.0 wasn't even released yet. It was just beta at that point. Um, so I had to go through the developer program if I ran into anything serious. So when I'm showing you my lab, here I am five years later, it's so delightful to have an, a lab without all kinds of errors and red bangs working right in my home. So now let me bring that up. And I'm actually going to log in in front of you here. So let me bring that screen up here. And there we go. You're seeing my vSphere client. Why does it look funny? Why does it not look like Chrome with a URL bar? Well, you guys remember I already told you how to make shortcuts. So I just clicked an icon on my taskbar on Windows, and this came up. Now, I, did, I didn't say I don't have yellow warnings. <laughs> And this is what I actually wanted to talk to you guys about here, where this launches Skyline. And you'll see, strangely, all four of my hosts, their network tests out fine, but a couple of them talk about this. So that's been my one niggling issue I couldn't finish fix last night. I was kind of hoping by some miracle VCSA upgrade from six dot, sorry, from 7.0B to 7.0C, which I succeeded with last night and recorded a video of. Yeah, it didn't help, right? This is an ESXi issue. This is my one last concern. Now, probably most of you that have labs or production, you're probably getting warnings about bias levels here. And, you know, we're talking about spectrum milk um, side channel attack kind of stuff. That's a little trickier to clear, but those are not a big deal. They don't result in yellow bank showing on all your hosts all the time. But I do want to point out that now that once we clear that, even on a fresh log in the morning, I don't have something nasty surprising me or red, red or yellows over here. I'm in good shape in my lab. In fact, I like to be able to look at it at a whim um, I actually found, I have an article where I cover how to avoid, you know, auto log off. All right, so what did my thing say I'm going to do? All right, let's try a clone of a Windows VM. All right, so now there's been no rehearsal here. Remember, I was just working in my lab last night. I believe, uh, let's see, which is a good VM we can look at. All right, let's start with the data store. So this thing's loaded up. The 12-core machine that's running my primary content producing VM that I'm running you know, the 4K video for my webcam, this uh, Camtasia recording, this Zoom meeting, it's all in the same VM, a very beefy VM that has lots of RAM. That's on my 12 core machine. I also render 4K videos on it. So it's busy a little bit right now inside the VM. Windows is doing its thing. And I give it a rather liberal 40 gig of RAM because why not? I got 120 gig of RAM in the machine. The primary intent of this 12 core machine is for creating content and I give it lots of RAM. I never come close to hitting any kind of paging, page files. But I do have a lot of drives in there. So the cube format, it might look tiny. Um, it's only like the height of three decks of cards, but you can stuff a lot of 3.5 inch drives and some of them are pretty darn big. Here you can see some, um, here's my capacities over on the right and, the, and then the amount of free space. So um, let's have a look here. How many VMs do I have running on this Samsung right now? Only one, the VM I told you about. So that's my top flight storage, the 960 Pro. So, how about we go and have a quick look at another VM to clone. And give me a second here. There's one machine I'm going to actually remove from the cluster to actually kind of avoid inadvertently um, showing some stuff I'm not quite ready to show on the summary tab. That'll help me kind of relax the rest of the demo. So bear with me while I just remove this from the inventory. And I'm not in maintenance mode, all right? So we got to shut that guy down. It's running folding at home at the moment. I don't, it's doing a graceful shutdown of any VMs it was running. And I should be able to remove it from inventory by making sure it's shut down. And of course I could have put it in maintenance mode as well. We can actually do that to save a little time. It might complain since it's going offline anyway. Yep, gotta wait a little longer. Um, so anyhow, we're gonna take another VM, we can clone it over, and then we can do a quick clone. But the point is it takes 15 to 25 seconds to clone a 15 gig copy of Windows 10. So with that kind of speed, you don't tend to bother with linked clones and so forth anymore. Uh, the raw speed of NVMe is pretty delightful in a lab if you haven't discovered that yet for people watching along. Uh, NVMe would definitely be a key thing to look for. And M.2 gunstick form factor NVMe tends to be uh, the most affordable. Of course. Oh, you need to mute everyone? Okay. Yep, we got a high pitch there. Oh, the person muted, though. Okay, most people have muted themselves at this point. So we're good. All right. Okay, another bug I noticed that's actually coming up later in my desk 
Once in a while, I'll have recent tasks not show. That's been a bug I've witnessed in my home lab for years. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, that's been pretty common. Now, luckily here, we got recent tasks showing, so you guys can see what I just did. And now we've got a three-node vSphere cluster. Three hosts, all of them are at 7.0, and they're all happy and healthy. And let's have a quick look at the summary tab. So I have three brands of ZND represented in my home lab. This one happens to be Supermicro. It's an eight core, eight physical core, so 16 logical because hyperthreading is turned on. Here we've got the 12 core, which is 24 logical. AMD Epic is coming out with competitive stuff that'll have even more cores, which is great to see and really good for home labs that run vSphere. And then finally, a newer Z Hyundai 2100 series CPU here, but it's only four core and its CPU is maxed out because it's running folding at home at the moment. Um, cranking up my numbers uh, over there. Um, most people are muted at this point, but I am kind of curious. You could throw it in the chat. Has anyone actually done folding at home VMs? And so we're, we're inspired by uh, Amanda Blevins and William Lamb over at VMware to contribute to that project. I'm curious if folks did that back in the March. Yep, there's a yep, yep. Yeah, it was kind of cool, right? Um, did you bother? The last home, the, the home yeah. lab uh, environment that we did for Cedar Park VMUG, they talked about it quite a bit as well. So it's great to be part of that team. Yeah, no, no thank you for sharing that. And, and some of the stats there have been um, fun to watch. And I think it was nice to light a fire under my uh, fellow Dell employees, at Dell Technologies as well. Um, here are some stats. And whose voice was that? I didn't quite catch whose mic was open, but uh, what's your first name? Matthew, thank you, Maggie. There you are. Okay. So yeah, if we, if we look at the leaderboard and all, you're kind of gamifying, you know, maybe trying to save humanity. It might be overstating the thing slightly, but, you know, maybe uh, get a um, a better understanding of COVID, if nothing else, uh, hopefully a little sooner, especially those of us with a uh, family in the healthcare industry, you tend to think about these things a little more maybe than others, although we're all in that together. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> And uh, the challenges that's had. And actually, when I had a power outage recently, too, that really skyrocketed things with elderly parents I was trying to help. So it's been an interesting uh, month for, I think, all of us all over the world, but particularly in the United States right now. Um, <laughs> looks like folding at home stats page is a little slow at the moment. Um, but anyhow, they, they had some real struggles uh, scaling in the beginning, too, I'll say. You may have run into that as well. I don't even know if that'll come up, so we'll, we'll move on. All right, so yes, enough of folding a home, but it's a good way to use a modest CPU. Instead of it earning, earning 35 watts, how about it burns 70 or 80 watts and just chugs away at it? These ZNDs, you can beat the heck out of them, even in fanless designs. They do quite all right, and Intel throttling doesn't even take care of turning them off, even at like 95 Celsius, and that's a bug I'm going to cover coming up here. Um, that came up recently where some folks were getting hot CPUs just by going to 7.0. That's a weird bug. All right. Yeah, load, fully at home webpage not coming up, so I'm going to move on. So we said we're going to look for a VM that I can potentially clone. Ideally one that's just Windows. Let's uh, skip over that one. It doesn't have anything suitable. And let's see what VMs. Ah, this one has a few VMs. All right. So um, let's find one that here's me messing around with GPUs and so forth. Might not be the best candidate. Here's me messing with NVMe boot drives instead of the default boot drive. Uh, which is an LSI SAS, if you look in Device Manager. And then here's one Prime. This one actually I booted pretty recently, so I'm going to probably go with this guy. And let's have a look at how big it is. So if we look at its data, here it is on a data store. And it looks like it might be kind of large. Here's the files that represent, I keep doing that wrong, sorry, just a second. So now that we're on the data store, we want to go to Files. And have a look. Here's my Prime. Looks like I last booted it June 24th. Like I said, fairly recent. It's kind of big. So that one's probably going to take more like um, probably closer to a minute. That's a pretty beefy one. But that's a pretty realistic uh, look at what my pe people actually you know do in their labs. So Prime 95, right? So if I do an inventory search of all my VMs, let's use the vSphere UI like we're supposed to. Okay, Prime 95 was my abuse tester VM here. And I'm going to go ahead and clone that to a virtual machine. Okay, where are we going to place it? 
don't really care too much about what folder I place it in. Let's just get this thing going and place it on a nice fast data store like this one. So notice how I've labeled my data stores here. Um, I did that because I like a sort order and I also like to see what capacity the drive has without have necessarily having to size or scroll across to all the columns. So that's just me. I have very evident, self-evident data store names because if I'm doing a video and doing stuff at the command line, it's nice to not have spaces in the names and it's nice to know what the heck it is I'm working on. So that's just my tip, how I do things. And they're all VMFS 6. So I actually reformatted them because some of them have been upgraded for ages since like the ESXi 5.5 days. And you'll want to watch out for that. Automatic space reclamation is not going to happen on older VMFSs. All right, so now we're testing cloning on a one gig network from my basement to my upstairs. That's going to take a little time. Um, and it's actually going uh, through two network switches. Not a big deal. Okay, while that's happening, let's go back to here where I said what I plan to show you. VMFS data store labels. What do you know? I just covered that. Updating VMware tools and updating VMware hardware. If you guys haven't checked that out, pretty cool stuff right there. Let's have a look. So while my clone is underway, let's go back to hosts and clusters view. All right. On host and cluster, clusters view, we've got tools. Now, what if we point to the whole cluster and we go to updates? Check this out. If you didn't discover these two little gems, maybe you haven't played around since the uh, six, five days or something. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Both VMware tools and upgrading VMware hardware for a variety of VMs, giving you point and click ways of not only inventorying it, but remediating it. Pretty nice stuff for home lab. So again, many, many of you may not have noticed that. Notice the one I work on and I care about and I'm using on a daily basis. That one I took care of right away. That one's up to date. The VM we're on has USB mappings into the VM and USB over IP to get audio working. So those are definitely some of my struggles. That's again, because I'm a little, I'm crazy enough to have a, uh, a workstation that's also my, my server. Let me just show you that quickly here. So yeah, I've got a GPU pass through to one VM for Windows 10, and that's actually how I'm doing things. But for keyboard, mouse, and audio, there's some strange things. There's also a, a William Lamb hack where you can map a keyboard and mouse to the VM only, but then you can no longer control the local UI of ESX. ESX. So I ended up going to the a Silex uh, USB over IP device to get around that. I know that's a super niche topic. Most people on the phone probably would never dream of trying such a crazy thing or even want to. It is time consuming and a bit brittle. Upgrades tend to break when you have pass through. <laughs> Bless you, whoever sneezed. All right, let's, let's go on to uh, the clone has taken a while. So we know my network might be a little suspect. We talked about that earlier and it failed. What do you know? That's, that's great. That's what you want to happen in front of an audience. Now I mentioned, I will acknowledge I've got a little network problem. Remember Skyline Health? You guys saw it warning me about one of my hosts a little unhealthy, but it didn't really guide me to which host. Well, you guys just got to witness that when I plugged in a whole bunch of network cables last night, getting ready for this demo, I inadvertently have introduced a little instability into the mix here. So if we go to configure, and look at my physical adapters. You can see I've got everything lit up. Well, one of the bugs I've noticed is, even though those ad other adapters aren't in use, my one gig that I am using for the vSwitch, where all my traffic is going, vMotion and management, it gets a little wonky. And you guys just saw it, a, a vMotion failed. So if I pull out these other three cables, most likely vMotion would finish. Okay, a little echo there. I'm just gonna move on, um, but anyhow, Yes, we, we all have challenges, all have rough edges, and I'll say this, if I light up my whole network with all network ports for demo purposes, I can run into network issues, so I tend to just pull the plug on every, anything but one or two NICs. I've even had issues with just two NICs plugged in, but no vSwitch assigned to VM, VM NIC 1. And this gets into the rabbit hole of which network adapter, VIB, do you want for your hypervisor? That should be easy, but unless it's a Dell or HP system, it's not. Lifecycle Manager doesn't really help you there. Um, so let me show you a couple of things. Okay, I wrote a little bit about that. Here's an article where you can just type a command and get your firmware and NIC driver. But on consumer products, you can't update the firmware. Yet another challenge of a home lab. If you buy an enterprise like Optane that's meant for ESXi, sure, you've got command, you've got ways of doing that. So yet another kind of a pitfall of running a home lab where you're 
some of the components, like the storage, are just Samsung 970 you know, consumer stuff. All right, let's get back on track to some of the stuff I wanted to show you in the demo here. Let's get that out of the way. All right, back to my deck, which looks like it stopped presenting. There we go. Folding at home we covered. Skyline we covered a little bit. Easy event viewing. Okay. Some of you watching might only use, say, ESXi hypervisor, in which case use the VMware ESXi interface. You log in with root, and you're in. And we're looking at the system. I just want to point out, you've got some tools here, like right there under monitor logs. If you're not a fan of grepping and, and Linux commands, you can actually see quite a bit right there. And I found sometimes support people on the, on the phone at VMware will walk you over to this spot too to check something like quick and dirty, like what might be wrong or see if my network's doing retries or something. So anyhow, in case you guys didn't know that, even the ESXi host client, you can get to logs. Let's have a look at the equivalent over in this side. So let's go to monitor. See, these are just events of what we did. This is kind of cool, right? This is looking at all the log files on the host without even getting your, you know, getting a SSH out. Maybe you don't even have SSH enabled. So there's your little tip there. All right, back on the deck. You saw the client, HTML5, of course. You know, we're long past Adobe Flash. Here's something I want to point out. It's actually in my, not in my deck here, so I'm going to add it. Um, So there's been various hints and release notes that your the days of getting a snapshot-based backup going and supported for reverting your VM, your uh, VCSA VM, your rather important VM, those are coming to an end. I believe it'll end up being something like that. I need to double check and see if they've anything official from VMware's come out about that. My point is, you've got to use the built-in tool, and I'm going to jump right over and show you. So when I say built-in tool here, here's my home lab, here's my Chrome profile for all my vSphere-y things. Got my vSphere, uh, darn. Um, let's see. So if we go here and go to, uh, here's all my PMI out-of-band management, right? But what I want to do at the moment is just go and show you VAMI. And here's my VAMI icon. It just quickly gets me into port 5480. Username, password, and there we go. So this interface has backup. And when you go to upgrade it, like when I went to version 7.0.0c last night successfully and recorded a video of it that I've already published. Um, when I did that, when I go through the wizard to do it, it makes sure that I've like certify. I, I click a checkbox saying I'm doing a daily backup. So if we sort my backups, you'll see daily backups are happening. And it looks like August 19th at 8 p.m. Okay, after my upgrade last night, I have an update. So it's still working and it's doing backups to a network share on my network. No reason for folks to not do this. Just create a backup job and you can point to even an SMB share, for example. Anyhow, my point, this would be the legit way to revert. If you have something bad happen to your VCSA appliance, VMware would typically guide you to restore from a backup, which involves downloading the large ISO, opening it, running the install wizard, but instead of installing VCSA 7, you're saying restore, and then you're pointing to the backup file. And then it uses that to magically basically hydrate a new VM with all your old stuff. And you pick up where you left off. So that's, that's not as easy as right-clicking and saying snapshot right before you're about to do a VM backup. Lifecycle Manager, let's cover that now. And then I open it up to anything else you'd like to try. So Lifecycle Manager, doing a quick time check. Okay, we're halfway. Cool. Here's Lifecycle Manager. So it's a renaming. Let's go to the top of my vSphere cluster. Let's go to updates. So we're going to work, start at the very top. Here we have something called update planner. Now in my case, there's nothing newer. It just checked. There's my Eastern time zone, August 20th. So this is just grayed out. That's why I record the video like last night where you see me actually go through all this, where basically it launches VAMI for you. So this interface comes from here. When you have an update that's pending, it gives you a blue button. It basically launches VAMI. And your update still happens from over here, in case you're wondering. This is one of the errors I noticed. 
And actually, let me just double check that that made it into my deck based on last night's experience. It looks like it did not, so I'm going to add it right now. And now I've got a slide with that error. That'll show you in a second. And basically, yeah, some of these little things, yeah, they're little things. They're not deal breakers. They just kind of bust your confidence a little. They're not what you would want to see in a production environment. Do I have a good ex explanation for why it's happening? Um, no, but in the forums, there are people talking about this exact error in the past. And um, just one second. Okay, yep, I don't, I don't have that in my handy Google history. But yeah, that's the bug. It's happened before, and it happened to me, maybe first in world on 7.0c, whatever. Um, minor seems to have no impact. What I did in the video, even on 7.0b, it came up. I was able to do check CD-ROM and URL. The error clears. It hit the web server, and it found the new update. So I was able to blow right past that minor error you guys just saw. Okay, and there you guys can see the update history in my lab. So there's a lot of richness that you need to, you know, dig around in the UI a little bit more to find. And... Um, they even have release notes links. So VMware's come a long way to not have you cut and paste and having to look for a KB article or whatever. Most of the things are just hyperlinked right there. Really, really handy. Uh, lots of little steps forward that you'll find that you probably don't even see in the release notes, even in VAMI. Okay, back to the vSphere client. I mentioned in the demo list that I had here, I wanted to show you Lifecycle Manager. Okay, now since I don't have any pending upgrades, you're not quite going to see all the details because I don't have any baselines attached right now. But there they are. So what I did was you add to your repository ESXi 7.0b when it came out, you attach it to a host, you check against the baseline and you update. It's not the most intuitive. I think it could still be better. Like frankly, I don't know, right clicking on a host and saying update could be even more intuitive, but VMware's definitely come a long way on all of that to um, help you on your way to do lifecycle management. Do you get, see this button, Manage with a Single Image? This is not a bug, but this is just me talking to you, the user group, about a, an issue here where you might think, oh, that sounds appealing, but think about that. They'd have to be the same brand. So watch what happens if I click this. Same vendor. So all hosts must be from the same vendor. That's a pretty important sentence right there. That's also a limitation. Remember, I have three vendors for my four hosts. So that's not as useful to me. Uh, but yeah, if you had four nodes of the same type, you could set up an image in ISO and then just blast it out to all four nodes. How's that for the ultimate, you know, in home lab efficiency of getting your host updated? Pretty cool. Um, VMware tools and VMware hardware we already talked about. Um, Skyline, you actually saw at the very beginning. And let me get that to show up again here. So I'm going to do a uh, log out. And let's see if it shows up as I come in where it said, hey, I found a little issue with networking. You want to have a look-see? Let's see if logging back in gets that to come up again. There might be a time run. It might not show until tomorrow because I cleared it. Yeah, it's not going to show. OK. And then here you can see me working on this last night, 17 hours ago. And um, Oh, yeah. What's a pre-check? Oh, boy. Um, so a good seven-year part of my post-sales storage support career was being on call and trying to help customers get ready for service maintenance windows where I'd sometimes be on site at an insurance company or hospital at 2 a.m. on a Sunday to do a major upgrade. You'd want to do a pre-check. So I think it's wonderful we're starting to get VMware software stack in the mentality of let the customer find surprises out before the weekend service window. I think that sounds like a pretty useful uh, feature. <laughs> I know in my own career that, uh, that kind of thinking is... Uh, Extremely helpful. Um, and here we are where it's warning me. I don't have DRS enabled or HA in my home lab right now, so that's fine. So basically, it's warning me there's going to be a downtime, of course. No problem. Um, I turn on and off my host so often, I don't tend to leave HA on, in my home lab. So that's all fine. Okay, and just to kind of clean up, there is no remediation to do. I'm going to detach that baseline because it's not. there's no work to be done here. 7.0c will probably come out momentarily, especially since VCSA 7.0.0c already came out. And then I'll have just a little bit of work to do. But it's nice to be able to fall back on my own article that walks me through. Um, and if we have a look here, I've got a vSphere 7 tab to make finding all my vSphere 7 articles uh, simple. All right, let's get back to the um, bugs here. So back to the slideshow. 
from current. There we go. So I hinted at this one, USB audio mapping. What do I mean? Let me show you. So VMs, I'm going to bring this up off site just a second. Got a couple of VMs I'm removing here. Give me a moment. I just need like a 20 second pause here. While I'm cleaning up a few things off screen that are not working yet. All right, so the VM we're working on called Win 10 Multiboot. Let's edit its settings. Okay, here you see a USB device, Synaptex. That's my fingerprint reader. Here's my list of other things that could be mapped to it. And the other thing that's USB mapped is a UPS signal cable. When I lose power in the house, gracefully shut down ESXi. So back in early August when I lost power for 55 hours, yes, all my VMs gracefully shut down because they have VMware tools, and I told ESXi to behave that way. And then ESXi itself was signaled to shut down gracefully. So that went well. But we're talking about sound and USB bugs right now. So I just wanted to show you some of my USB devices come from there, and then the rest of them come from this thing called SX Virtual Link. This is with the Silex USB over GPU product. I spent 20 or 30 hours of one weekend. It was miserable getting audio, my video, my cameras, everything working. Why? Because my day job, I'm using my camera upstairs, my webcam, because of her Zoom calls. I'm RDPing to a laptop, and I map over RDP my USB cam to the remote laptop. In other words, it's essentially a 70-foot cable from my webcam to my laptop. It's a virtual link. And the software I'm using to attach all um, USB devices in my lab to my VM, this is how you do it. If it doesn't work here, you move it over to software USB over IP. I'm showing you this because it worked on 6.5 and 6.7. Um, all these devices here were actually mapped through VMware's native functionality. Something regressed. Maybe we went back a level on the USB driver. I don't know what VMware did there, but you know, I revealed some a bug. I tried removing the USB 2 controller. I tried the USB 3 controller only or USB 2 only. None of that helped. I basically had to move over to another solution to get my sanity back and be ready so that when Monday morning hit, I had a working workstation where I could RDP my laptop and just continue going through Zoom calls. So again, a rather niche thing, but still a bug that bit me. And we're going to talk a little bit about what do you do about a bug like that and how do you report it? That's coming later in my deck. Okay, this next one, GPU pass-through. This was a squirrely one. I found a workaround and I knew a lot of other people would probably find the same thing. And I looked in the VMTN forums. I couldn't find anyone talking about it. So I went and documented it said, here's my workaround, and now it's months later. Let's see how many people have watched that video. 3,600 people. That is not good. <laughs> so that's a lot of people that would not watch this video for pleasure. They probably got bit by the same darn bug. Um, so that's one way to report it, where I tried to help the maximum number of people as quickly as possible, and there's 32 thumbs ups there. So that's kind of crazy. <laughs> that's a lot of people spending um, five minutes to watch a, a workaround, how to f not get too nervous after rebooting the machine and all their mappings go away. The workaround, luckily, is just click a couple checkboxes and you're good to go. Um, so it's a little sad, a little bit of a rough edge, but yep, that's that's another bug I revealed. And um, I guess it's been a part of my career is finding bugs and, and reporting them, you know, responsibly and so forth. That one is not serious. It doesn't affect, you know, data center security or um, stability. It's just probably more likely home labbers that try to use GPUs for, you know, light gaming or something. Or, you know, Microsoft Flight Simulator that came out two days ago. Who the heck would do that? Uh, no, that'd be me attempting that. Just because. All right, we talked a little bit about that already. This one we just witnessed together. Cosmetic. Hangs out when you look at the uh, update screen in VCSA, but it doesn't really instill confidence. I would hope VMware gets that squared away by update one. So when you're in production on 7.0 update one, you don't see, you know, nagging things like that that have no consequence or real meaning. Okay, this one was a little bigger. Check this one out. I'm clicking my own link. It's bringing up my own article. I went and screenshotted it. Also super common. So in the early days, this is July. I, I wish I got this article out earlier to save more people. So from April 2nd, um, sure, you had 7.0. But then in, um, was it late June? Whenever 7.0.b arrived, there was trouble. You got either this error, error expected, now that makes sense. Maybe VMware's backend web server that it's trying to hit just wasn't ready. So that's not real shocking the day that a 
you know, an update comes out. But the next one was a little, um, a little worse. <laughs> you think you're okay, you get the code, and you're going through the installer and it fails. vCenter is not operational. Not what you want to see. And then you're talking about go to backups to recover. How's that for a, you know, sad trombone moment? So that's a bummer, but I found a workaround. A little Reddit thread and a little bit of Googling later. There it is. I credit the Redditor, right, who found this first. But he didn't quite have, you know, screenshot in the, all the details. So I went and wrote an article. And that's another example. Uh, let's have a quick look at how many poor souls have had to watch that video. Grammarly helps make your okay, only 186 on that one. So there you have it. Um, some more rough edges. Again, this has happened my whole career. I, every major release of all kinds of software. None of this is shocking to me. It's just, it's, it's there. And I did sign up for maybe beta program, which you have to sign non-disclosures for. But that, well, I'm, think, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that. Being a blogger, you don't always want to sign non-disclosures, right? And um, I also don't have a lot of spare time like most of you. So beta testing is a, it's a commitment and you need to regularly provide feedback. Um, and that can be difficult to do with all of our busy day jobs. Let's move on to the next little bug. Please unmute if you've experienced, um, you know, one of these bugs or you want to chime in at any moment because that's part of what I, uh, I like to talk about. Um, we talked about that one, recent tasks. And this one, it's a real stretch, but if anyone ran into recent tasks not showing, yeah, I'm making a really big leap here. Maybe it's related to me, you know, basically hacking vSphere client to not log off after 120 seconds. Uh, 120 uh, minutes, excuse me, two hours. I seriously doubt it. Okay, here's a more nasty um, issue. Try not to use the word bug. Let's call it an issue. Elasticsky.com. Elastic Sky being the original name of ESX, right? Elastic Sky. Um, anyhow, overheating and throttling. This is one of the more serious bugs I've seen in a while. I don't know if any of you ran into that because you probably you would have to own one of these newer ZND2100 systems that probably cost you more like $2,200 and up. So a higher end ZND that uses a little more watts, but not this many. Uh, 90 degrees Celsius is pretty serious. So it's pretty interesting that tests like Prime95 that abuses CPU don't even get that high. I don't know what on earth went wrong there, but some upgraders to 7.0b uh, weren't too fond of their machine getting all sluggish because the CPU was protecting itself from meltdown. So it was lowering its gigahertz. No permanent damage, mind you. Xeons are very good at handling it, but kind of a bummer that, you know, ESXi hypervisor ended up being a, a, um, having that bug. So the patch was to go to seven. Um, you got to read the whole article to find out what the fix was, but there is a fix. So hats off to Michael for taking some of his, you know, evening or weekend to document for this, this for the world. And since we're recording this in video, the responsible thing to do is to actually show you guys the fix. Here comes the article. So Kevin Johnson also confirmed he had the same problem. The discussion in the VMTN threads, I actually saw some of those tweets. Twitter's pretty useful for this kind of stuff. And there you go, a bias release from Supermicros would fix this one. Now, will this happen on a ZND on a Dell or other companies? Who knows? But it's possible you'll start to see over time some other reports of high CPU. Um, isn't the community wonderful to take the time to do this and to help each other have each other's back? All right, back to the slides. Next. Um, yeah, 10 gig, I already mentioned it, but it cropped up just a couple days ago. This screenshot I took um, last night. So Brandon Lee of Virtualization How To. He does a fantastic job with highly detailed screenshot for screenshot walkthroughs that take enormous gobs of his time to do. It's not easy, blogging, um, to justify your you know time that way. Awesome comments where he's talking about, hey, Paul, I also had the 10 gig problem on one of my machines. And uh, someone named Blog This on Discuss goes into great detail on what he found. And for him, it seemed to be thermal with his 10 gig problems. Mine never seemed associated with the temperature of the system at all. So go figure. It's been one of the most complicated bugs I've run into my entire 30 ish year IT career. Um, this strangeness with 10 gig networking on certain motherboards where you literally have to unplug them to recover, unplug power to recover. All right, now I'm moving on from the word um, issues or bugs and I'm trying the words confidence inhibitors. <laughs> so when you see stuff like this from time to time in your home lab, 
it just shakes your confidence a little. Like, why am I seeing this? But this has been true for a while. Six five, six seven had similar ones. You'd occasionally, we already talked about the second one, the health issue. That's probably my networking one. And that I'll get to go away by removing those extra network cables. But the first one, API endpoint, I have no idea. Um, I just reset it to green. It hasn't come up since. This all happened right after VCSA upgrade when my CPU was exhausted. So was my CPU exhaustion so bad that I started coughing up spurious errors that are yellow here? Who knows? I doubt I'm going to take the time to repeat it. The way to repeat it would be to go reverting to 7.0b and then do the upgrade to 7.0c again and see if these updates, these errors are coughed up right after the upgrade. My guess is the system was just busy churning away at the CPU, doing some sort of internal housekeeping for the first few minutes after the reboot. That was my theory I recorded on YouTube last night during my successful upgrade. And I mentioned I already gave this um, more vCPUs and I already gave it more memory when I had memory exhaustion issues. So my point is there seems to be a thing with vSphere 7 vCSA appliance, which has gotten a little beefier since 6.7 update 3. That appliance does seem a little bit prone to CPU and memory exhaustion errors coming up particularly after upgrades, but they can happen at any time. So there you go. You heard it here. If you run into that, you know, reach out to me on Twitter or something. Say, hey, Paul, I just ran into that same thing. You mentioned the DCV mug. That's useful. Um, or even better, leaving a comment below the video on my site or the article that talks about this. Um, and let me take a moment to show you this stuff. So if we go to um, my videos, I've got playlists for you trying to keep it organized where I've got an ESXi 7 playlist. So if we dive into there, it should be pretty easy to spot the new video I just published last night. Here's the successful update from 70B to 70C. My videos are almost unedited. I just speed up the boring parts with time lapse. But the reason they're unedited, the rough spots are kind of what they are what you want to see. Um, these little things that happen in the comments I make about memory and CPU, they're all in that video, right? So. That's why I try to add a little value above and beyond, um, you know, most videos there. And that's particular Chrome, by the way, is not logged in, so I don't have YouTube Premium, so it's going to play a commercial. Um, basically, the only way to go with YouTube these days, because they they punish you if you don't, um, yeah, come on, um, it's a problem. <laughs> YouTube is free web hosting, but they're pushing content creators more and more towards ads, which can be a little frustrating. But anyhow, that's just a pre-roll ad you're able to skip in five seconds. So here's the 88 people looked at that, okay. In this video, you'll see the CPU exhaustion check uh, happen right after it. So that's my way of, you know, if you bump into it, at least now you have something to find on the Googles about it. Okay. All right, we're getting near the end of the, the bugs that I found. I'm soon going to want to open the microphones up again, see what bugs you found. Okay, next slide. It's in the same category of inhibitors. It's not real serious. It's just a nuisance. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of maybe out of scope for today. But filling SSDs to 1,000, 100%, excuse me, that can be problematic if you got like a four-year-old NVMe drive that didn't do very good garbage collection and housekeeping and its firmware, where it would be on its knees for seconds or even minutes. Um, which would really irritate something like a vSAN, but even just a regular VMFS data store, um, could act real wonky with old SSDs if you fill them to 100%. My little trick there is just when you go to format at VMFS, only use 95% of the drive, kind of like your uh, own hot sparing technique. Newer drives like the Samsung 970, um, they're better. You can fill them to 100%. You're not going to hurt the um, performance as drastically as it used to be in the early days of SSDs. When you went past 95% full, performance really tanked. So I like to have the same performance always. So I just VMFS format and leave 5% unformatted. I've been doing that even on recent drives, maybe more out of habit than anything. And let me um, mention that drives of the M.2 gumstick variety, they're now pretty big. So I went and invested in a four terabyte. There's also an eight terabyte that's slower. I went for the four terabyte faster one. A pricey investment, here's all about it. And here's my story. It worked beautifully with ESXi 7.0. It's the only consumer drive in the market. For some reason, Samsung hasn't gotten there yet. And there's me installing it with a heatsink. And holy smokes, the heatsink, and this is the first time ever, the heatsink actually mattered. Um, pretty obvious that on the right, we've got a heatsink and we're totally outperforming on the left. So I'd love doing a little test like that. This is a Windows 10 VM. Yes, it's an artificial benchmark. 
So I went and did some cloning, and guess what? Cloning was still within a 5 or 10% performance. It wasn't 30% like the artificial benchmark would tend to hint. And then I went into you know firmware and all that on this consumer drive because I wasn't as familiar with this brand. And there's the specs. So things have actually gotten faster than Samsung at this point. This thing soundly um, exceeded my 960, my 970 Pro uh, Evo in my home lab. Okay. Back to the deck. Okay, we have more time too. So this is for you know anything else you guys wanted to see in the lab. Um, before I open it to questions, I have one more topic about support, and we'll and we'll open it wide. And it's kind of um, potentially a bit of a rabbit hole. Yeah, let me let me pause. I'm going to unmute now. Any questions about what you saw so far? And then we're going to pivot to a little bit different angle on this whole thing about what do you do for support in home lab. But any questions about what you saw or anything you want me to show in my home lab, now would be a great time. I'm unmuting all. This could be interesting. Hey, that went well. We're not hearing open mics. Um, it was slow. It's saying all participants are unmuted, but most of you voluntarily muted your local mic. It's fine. Okay, so go ahead and take yourself off uh, mute. If you have any questions at this time, because my goodness, you've uh, endured me speaking for... Uh, 72 minutes straight. So, questions, anybody? Let me look at the chat and see if anyone's having any issue with me as moderator. Even though I unmuted, people should be able to unmute themselves at will. Okay, we do have some questions for the last 20 minutes. Let me let me catch up on those. Have I found a replacement for the Ubiquiti M Pro Power Pro? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, let me show what we're talking about. I did extend the life of mine, so rather than throwing it in the recycle bin, because the software for it is uh, end of life, I found a way to rename the ports on this lovely device, which gives me a live look at my power utilization on all my uh, devices in my lab. Uh, even better than talking about it, let me uh, show it to you. But no, and alas, I've not found a competitor in the U.S. marketplace uh, that has anything uh, nearly as good. And it was only, um, the price was right. It was uh, under $100. It had an Ethernet at Jack. I was no interest in Wi-Fi. I just wanted Ethernet and individual port control of eight different network ports. And here's a video of me, you know, renaming devices accordingly. So remember I mentioned I have to de-energize a motherboard if my 10 gig goes down? So I was able to do that even when I was you know, far away in DC or something from a hotel room, I could turn on and off the machine, de-energizing the complete motherboard with this lovely little device that looks like, uh, let's see if I do some picture of it here. Looks like that, each port individually addressable. I'm sorry, I wish I had better news for you on the chat. Um, whoever asked that, I gotta scroll back. Wow, we got a ton of questions, great. Roderick Moore, thank you for that great question. Um, when building your lab VMs, what are people doing for Windows licenses? Yeah, that's an open question from Denny. That's a difficult one. If your employer doesn't give you MSDN, Microsoft's made it harder and harder. At this point, generous 120-day license keys for you know, uh, Windows Server 2019 might be a way some people go, um, but it's getting more and more painful on the client side. Um, yeah, if you work for a large enterprise and you, you have you know, legitimate ways to help with a lab and non-production environment, that's cool, but I would say Microsoft making it harder. I had MSDN for about 22 years uninterrupted, and I, I lost it recently uh, two job changes ago. That's painful. But I don't need to know SQL Server as much anymore with VCSA baking most of that in. Uh, next question from Aaron. Image-based backups of VCSA is deprecated but still supported. Okay, good points. Let's see. Let me just put the chat right here in the video. Um, use the internal backup tools now so you're prepared for when it becomes unsupported. Yeah, so as I was saying, I don't think we're going to find it documented from VMware they're going to drop with update one. But it seems like they might be setting the stage for that. I have no special knowledge of that. That was just me poking on forums like four months ago. So don't forget to exclude VCSA from your image-based uh, system. Awesome advice from Aaron K. This is great. Um, well, I'll just throw, show the chat here. Denny, Matt is talking to Denny. Okay, I'm going to move forward. He's talking about 60-day trials. Uh, DJ Lee, more advice there. USB thumb drive. Okay. Great question. I tend to still do this. I know it's a little lazy because it's old, but in a home lab, I'm not rebooting very often. I'm not abusing this drive at all. I use these little SanDisks, 32 gig. I haven't had one fail on me yet. 
um, in the lab. I've had some fail in other uses, like for music or uh, dash cam recording. That's constant, right? Of course, it's going to abuse it and kill it. But for ESXi, which is mostly read, these little sand disks just keep going, and they've been widely available for many years, so it was a good choice. They were actually shipped out with those systems, the bundles. And I use these little labels, so because my lab has a crazy number of these lying around, I label them clearly, like ESXi 7.0 and then which host it goes in. That's just me. It also lets me clone them. So let's, let's talk about that. So remember I mentioned I have that article about ESXi Easy Update? And I talk about, hey, user, back up. I don't just warn you to back up. I have a walkthrough video, and I give you a tool to do it. It's called Image Tool, on Windows anyway. You clone it, and you label the two, and then you upgrade one of them, and then you erase the pencil and put 7.0 if you succeed. You have no risk that way, and you can go back to 7 or 6.x, whatever, without any impact. So yeah, got you covered there. Complete backup process if you want to go that route. If you start having internal drives like the um, Dell BOSS module, which is a RAID 1 mirror of AHCI SATA drives, they're not NVMe drives, but they're nice and affordable and resilient, um, it gets a little more complicated, frankly, to clone those. You can use something like CloneZilla, perhaps. Cloning ESXi has been difficult over the years in general. Um, oh, these questions are fun. This is great. I'm having fun here. Let me get the questions back on my screen here. Oh, I was supposed to be showing you a live look at my network ports. Let's see if I remember the username and password that was last set because I had to reset it to factory defaults. And it looks like um, my password manager does not have that password set. So basically at this point, it looks like I'm embarrassing myself a little bit by being back at factory defaults without that, that one locked down. So uh, I've log I'm not logging into this at the moment. But anyhow, the question wasn't really about seeing it. I have articles and videos demonstrating that in Power Pro. All right, back to chat here. All right. Maybe I shouldn't have all that in the video. Sorry about that, guys. Um, yes, people make mistakes with microphones. Let's be nice. No big deal. This is a casual VMUG here. We're pretending we're in the room together. Okay. Um, Al, I think I sifted through the questions. I'm going to do some props I'm going to show on camera, and then I'm going to go back to that kind of different topic about support. Um, camera. Let's stop sharing for a moment. Back to my Zoom controls. Bear with me, folks. Man, I'm delighted to see 66 people stuck with us. That's fantastic. Okay, we've got me back on camera. And props for you. There, I'm using my Zoom session of, so I can see my own video. A uh, quick check on the quality. Does not look too good to me, so this might not work out so well. How are people doing on the quality of the Zoom? Could someone give me a heads up on chat? We all missed the last few questions and answers. Oh, darn. Okay, I haven't heard anyone speak in a while. Al, are you there? Am I having a sound problem, or what's up? If someone could unmute and let me know. Al, can you hear me? Hmm. Okay. Let me um, leave audio and come back in. All right, I'm back. Different microphone. You guys hear me okay now? I hear someone's keyboard. Uh, okay, we're back. Can you guys hear me now on a different microphone? All right, I must have bumped the other one or the USB is lost. I am so sorry. How many minutes did you guys lose me? Was it 10? Was it 1? Uh, I am so sorry.
interesting that wow I actually lost audio okay all right well all right so you want me to hit mute all now until the very end then what am I doing Okay, everyone's muted, and I've got the chat window right next to me. How is the quality of video for you folks? Give me a thumbs, you know, high, medium, low. So can someone give me a little feedback now that you're hearing me? How's the video look? Good. Okay. Well, is that a good for video? Awesome video. Okay, excellent. So props it might be useful. We'll start with VGP or GPUs that like to be passed through. NVIDIA, not so much. I played with that one, just pointing that out. The one I'm still using to this day is four years old, but it won't run Flight Simulator very well at all. It's this guy. And no, there's no static problem. My house is actually kind of humid at the moment. I'm not going to be ruining anything holding it. Big hop, copper heat sink. It's a Vision Tech AMD based card. AMD is, in general, friendly to pass through. Um, M.2 cards, it's like $70 from Asus. It's not a RAID adapter, it's just simply wire traces bringing your M.2. Gumsticks, all four of them, to a uh, by 32 PCIe slot. All four of them run at full speed. A nice affordable way to get yourself more storage and servers that can fit it. So these are just some quick props I would show you if I was actually out of VMUG in the room with you. Um, here's a little more unusual one that somebody in the audience might know what it is. Let's see if someone wants to guess what this is. Let's see if we can get autofocus to do its thing. Yeah, so much for autofocus, give me. All right, the Logitech Brio Cam does not want to go and look at something close, but you might see enough there to know what connector that is. Anyone in the chat know what we're looking at? <laughs> token ring. Wow, I didn't dig token ring out of my basement. Um, so what we're looking at is proprietary connector that Supermicro and others, actually it might be just Supermicro uses, locking connector the other end will look a whole lot more familiar. Ah, uh, anyone know what that is? It's got a power drop for getting power from a SATA drive here. That's a hint. What is this end? What kind of drive does that go to? Anybody know? Yeah, SAS expander, essentially. Yeah, this end of that cable. Um, LF, I'm forgetting the acronym at the moment. But anyhow, this cable goes to a particular type. I'm going to give the folks a hint. We're doing the little Q&A here. An NVMe type of drive. It's actually hot swap too. Yay for autofocus. Finally, the Brio cam got it. Just to show you guys, I got the, uh, you know, Instagram model webcam light here. You're looking at the Brio cam. That's how I'm running the room. <laughs> and since we're all at home more, you gotta pay attention to that because the bright window lighting might, I look really weird next to the window and all backlit. Um, so the drive that goes into is right here. ta -da! I'm showing you a hint at the bottom of it. It's got an aluminum extruded heat sink embedded right in the drive. There you go. So that's a U.2 connection. So there's your little drive tutorial today. It's keyed, it can only go in one way. That's how you can plug in a U.2 drive inside a chassis that inside of a rather tall bay. It looks like a laptop 2.5 inch drive, it's just extra tall. There you go. Hopefully you learned something about storage today. And then finally, when you really want to get creative, let's say your motherboard only has an M.2 gum stick. Well, you can plug this into the gum stick form factor on the motherboard and run the cable and then do something like plug in an Intel Optane drive, a U.2 drive to it. So yes, there's lots of adapters out there to go U.2.M.2, in case you didn't know. All right. Um, Bifurcation, PCI slot. If your motherboard supports bifurcation, you get two PCI slots out of one. Another little hardware trick. And then finally, uh, a fancy packaging here. You're hearing all kinds of noises from me. Another nice prop for uh, when you're doing a live demo of stuff in front of user groups. That's the other form factor of NVMe. That would be a PCIe slot, right? Notice it doesn't use 32 lanes. It doesn't need them. Okay, back to the presentation where I mentioned I'm going to pivot to another topic, and that's about how to handle support. He Whoops, eh, that's fine. I'll stop video for now anyway. Let's go back to sharing my desk. Screen two. So 
support challenges. All right, quick check. Can you list these items on the chat? Which items? Oh, okay. Yeah, good point. Let's see. Yeah, I think a VMUG I did in New York probably had most of the same props. I might be able to link to them. That's fair. Remember I said I have the, I'll have the presentation ready by like 4.30? Um, I'll go ahead and add links to what I just shut off. No problem. Some of them are old, some are new devices. Thank you for the question. All right. So I guess the video worked. That's great. Um, so VMUG Advantage, Eval Experience, and VMware vExpert programs, they don't include any support. That's kind of a kind of a doozy, right? If you find a, a bug or a problem, uh, either way, you don't have recourse other than VMTN forums and stuff like that and hoping for, you know, tweeting out to people that follow you. Who knows? All sorts of informal ways of support. But yeah, oh, since I'm running content creation on a production VM, that's why I bought vSphere Essentials. Uh, I'm licensed, I'm legit, and that's me. I pay the 576 for that. Partly as an experiment earlier this year, but I really want to know what experience, readership experience is. If I open a trouble ticket, it's not as a blogger or as an employee of whatever company. It's just me as a content creator, as a blogger, excuse me. I'm not calling, representing some other company or, or day job stuff. And this stuff is not owned by my day job companies anyway. This is stuff I bought um, and invested in. So to try to open a ticket um, on April, maybe 10th it was, probably a week and a half after April 2nd, GA availability of the vSphere 7.0 bits, I tried to do a per incident support for vSphere Essentials. And I failed. All right, so that's the gist of it. So even though the SYS5028 TN4D, um, even though the system is CPU in it, it's called the ZND 1500, it is on the VMware compatibility list. That doesn't matter to the VMware support agent you're talking to, in my experience. Um, it needs to be, the system needs to be on the list. And as of this moment, when I checked last night, it's still not, unfortunately. This is a hyperlink, so let's go ahead and bring that up. And here it is, 5028D. Oh, that link is not a good one. Let's see what happened. Oh, never mind. This browser has a problem. I do actually have to uh, rebuild my Windows workstation at some point. It's been a good four years. It's going to actually work in Firefox and not in Chrome. How's that for a weird issue? Um, 5028D, notice there's no 7.0 column. So that's a problem. And it's a showstopper. That was the end of the support call. He was polite about it, but um, yeah, I was trying to open some reports or even just do a bug report and I failed. Now, you might say, well, can't you just use the feedback? Well, maybe, but it's not exactly a close the process and you have no idea if it worked. And I've had mixed luck with it. Um, we're talking about this. So a little smiley face in the upper right of your VCR client if you haven't discovered it yet. Yeah, that's your chance to send feedback on the spot. But this is not anything like opening a trouble ticket and you know, giving your email and having someone follow up. I submitted bugs in here, but I, I, I can't, I'll admit I haven't gotten feedback. Whether, even when I was working as a VMware employee, it didn't matter what email address I put in there. It's just, you know, massive audience, of hundreds of thousands of sysadmins out there using this. So I'm glad they have the tool there and it's awesome that it has screenshots and all, but it's not gonna be your, you know, primary mechanism for bug reporting. Certainly not for troubleshooting. All right, another technique is just, how about a video that helps people? <laughs> this feels kind of um, opportunistic might be the right word. Uh, it feels a little, it's not ideal, <laughs> right? It, it can get a whole lot of other people, you know, help quickly. And seeing the numbers in the thousands or tens of thousands should indicate to VMware, wow, we really do have an issue to, to address here, but it's certainly not ideal. But I do find it helpful. Um, and these are not nasty videos. They're just simple things that I often find a workaround for by the end of the video, right? Um, this one, this first one is more like a product feature feedback. How to kill a zombie data store. I end up with a situation with a moved drive. Had a data store I could not nuke. There's a way to manually remove that row from your VCSA table. That's, that's hacking, basically, but it's doable in a home lab and gets you back on track to producing content without goofy red X's through stuff. The rest of them are in the category of kind of issues I, I encountered. So this is also a hot link. It brings up the vSphere 7 um, YouTube playlist I showed you earlier. So some of these you might run into, at least you'll have a video that shows you how I got out of trouble. Um, but you know, will they show up as fixes in this update one? I don't know, we'll see. And then finally, some people don't care. Like they just hand me down eBay stuff that's seven years old. It's a, a you know, Dell um, PowerEdge something from way back long ago where it's not gonna be ever supported for 6.7, never mind 7.0. They would have all kinds of warnings here. 
and they're fine with it. And that's okay. If your system's stable, I understand some people's mentalities like that. For me, it's a little different. I'm running some production workloads and I'm also creating content. I need a system that's fully supported. So I'm a little bit, you know, niche. I don't know if there's two people on the phone and the um, Zoom here or, or 20 others, 50 something, 54 left. Um, I have no idea. Um, but that's part of what I wanted to open. And then future, I just give some, uh, this will be in the deck. You can read that later. Just ideas I have of things I'd like to work on. I always have skunk work, you know, things. Always more ideas than I have time to ever possibly publish. I have over 100 draft articles I never saw the light of day among my 1,000 articles that are public on my site. Um, that's just kind of the ADD in me, I guess. But um, some of these might totally uh, strike you as interesting. Others you might be bored to tears and not care about. Some of these are super niche. But I tend to write about whatever I happen to be working on at the moment. Or whatever. Uh, it, it doesn't tend to ha always have too much to do with how many people it's going to help necessarily. Again, it's because it helps me learn by typing and documenting what just happened. And now if I get bit by it again a few years down the line, I have a reference for it. Okay, so I think it is time to open up the lines here. And this is just me to open it up to Q&A. You know, I kind of showed you the current state of things in my home lab, which is not perfect. No one's home lab ever is. And the one on the right is a little more fuzzy because of where I'm going. It looks like 2021 is going to be the year of CPU advancements that excite me more. This year, not a whole lot happening in that space that's really um, exciting me. All right, so... Now I'm gonna unmute all, and I'm so sorry for whatever happened earlier. I don't know what someone said or if anyone was offended, and I really apologize there was 10 minutes. I think what I'll do is since I do have a, U a recording for YouTube, I can cut out the, uh, the dead air there and blur out any chat that might've been weird. So here we go with unmute, please. Um, I'm gonna play whack-a-mole quickly if something weird happens that I hear. So sorry that somehow bumped my microphone earlier off by unmuting folks, that is really bizarre. Okay, all participants are now unmuted. Sound check. Can anyone hear me? Can someone talk? Thank goodness. <laughs> You're there. All right. Nothing bad happening on the audio now. That's good. Um, any questions, thoughts, uh, particularly about the topic that's I just covered, and that is where to go from here, like uh, better ways to report things. Uh, people have better ideas than I come up with. I'm, I'm, I'm super open-minded to it. But at the moment, you know, I recorded a 10 minute Camtasia. I published it to YouTube and I kind of move on with life. And if someone has, is able to watch it and fix the product because of it, awesome. The part that's missing is a reliable way to report that to, you know, the right people that would care. That's a challenge I've had for, well, over a decade. So yeah, anyone have any stories or any um, thoughts on all of that? Maybe joining the beta program is the way to go. Yep, go ahead. Oh, they'll run it fine. They got the same motherboard as my mini tower, but they're not supported either. Um, it's looking more likely that the eight core mini tower um, from Wired Zone is the one that'll get supported because, well, there's a thousand people that invested their money in that thing. And um, Wired Zone is working hard with uh, VMware and Supermicro to make that happen. That's not great news for the one U owners out there, but yeah, the, the mini tower has been far and away the most popular because it's so much quieter than the one U's. So probably not the answer you wanted. I've uh, got to be careful here. E300 and E200. Are you talking about the ZND 1500 versions from like three years ago? Or are you talking about the ZND 2100 versions from a year and a half ago? If I could ask Danny uh, to clarify his question, that'd be helpful. Um, older ones. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, it doesn't look great, honestly. So the, the machine that would be first would be this guy. But... Supermicro, like any company, they make a decision. At what point do they want to orphan off older stuff or do they want to encourage people to buy the new stuff? They're a white box maker. I'm not being disrespectful in any way to say they have financial decisions to make and it costs real money and lab time to submit machines to the 7.0 compatibility list. So their focus, if you look at the VMware compatibility list, has been on newer stuff. That tends to come first. Like the 18-month-old ones get on the list first. So will the uh, one use make it E200, E300? I, you'd have to ask Supermicro that question. And literally, I'm not punting to them. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to ask them. That would be the best approach to directly contact them as a customer. That's far better than for me since I don't, um, I borrowed those machines, had them for a few weeks, but I didn't have the money to, to buy them and keep them. I just stuck with the mini tower and focused on that. I'm sorry, Danny. It's an honest answer. Um, Patrick, is 12 core not as good as 8 core? Oh no, I'm not saying that. Uh, it's it's better uh, linear scaling for my 4K video rendering. I use the 4, 12 core all the time. I could justify the extra $600 for having 12 cores versus eight. 
For me, heck yeah, the 12 core was worth it, Patrick. Um, they're otherwise identical, just, you know, more coarse. Um, good question. Let me scroll back a little further in the questions. 400 bucks. Nice. So what are the ports? Are they all RG45, SAP Plus? Okay, and that was desirable for you. Yeah, some of these, the systems I focused on, you'll notice the advantage of RJ45 is you can use it to go back to one gig if you want, you know, four network ports that are all one gig. That's cool. But it does use a little more power and they get a little little warmer. SFP, now you're dealing with buying direct attached cables or um, transceivers and a little more money. So that's kind of a personal preference thing. So back to uh, spitballing about the future. Exactly. And some systems I've looked at have offered both. Like this blurred out system on the right offers both, giving users choice. That's kind of cool. If a small system that's quiet offers you both SFP Plus or RJ45 without having to buy something, that's pretty cool for home lab, right? So those are all things I think about when I imagine, um, you know, what's the next thing that costs around two to three grand that people could really use for four or five years? And don't get me wrong, this has been completely successful. Owning a, a system that I've used so many hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours, um, for four years and abused like pretty much on a daily basis, I am so delighted I was able to hang on and keep using the systems, one of them for three years and the other for four years. The 12 core came later. The 8 core I've been busily using for over four years now. I'm super happy about that. That's a tech success to me. I don't have the time or money to go replacing it every year or two. This is not like the gaming industry where motherboard comes out like all the time. And servers tend to come out less often anyway. So I'm pretty eagerly looking forward to the next generation of 2021. You'll hear from me at TankerTry.com when we get vSphere 7 support on some existing machines. Of course, I'll break that news to everybody. I'm pretty eager to hear that myself. And then you'll you know, keep an eye on the latest CPUs and the, with the amazing core counts we're getting. Right now, VMUG Advantage, by the way, is limited to 32 cores in your lab. And I found that out how? Because that's how many I had in my lab. Well, but when I had four nodes here, I actually reached right to the limit when I went to license these. <laughs> I was able to light up my whole lab, but I don't have any more room with VMUG Advantage license key anyway. So just a little fun fact, people don't tend to think about that. They think 32 is a lot of cores. Well, if you have four systems and you get an AMD Epic or the new Xeon's coming out, 32 isn't what it used to be. <laughs> I'll, I'll just leave it at that, especially if you're doing NSXT or VCF and that stuff. All right, cool. Um, what else is showing up in the chat? And thank you, thank you, Lee. Any other comments about your uh, switch there? So how many ports are on it? I think you might've mentioned it and I missed it. Cool. Like if some of you have a day job where you're working with Arista switches, that's highly desirable, right? To get the same thing. I just happened to show Ubiquity because I was already familiar with their user interface. Uh, doesn't mean that's for everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no no one la home lab good for everybody. That's for sure. People have all different ideas of what a home lab means, for sure. Yep. It's a, it's interesting, too. When I speak to different VMUX, it depends on the geography. Buffalo, electricity, pretty darn cheap. Hydroelectric all. Here in Connecticut, not so much quite costly electricity. So we each have a different slant on what our um, spousal acceptance factor would be for the electric bill, right? And for me, it was just too darn high with rack mount hand-me-down stuff. So that doesn't speak for everyone, just that that was my situation, kind of what got me motivated to find stuff uh, that's efficient. Um, okay, so we got any other questions? Uh, what time? Oh, 3.48 p.m., is that the one? Okay. Any recommendation for, but thank you, Al. Any recommendation for a budget-friendly NVMe or SSD drive to use in a RAID 6? Ooh. And what would you recommend for backing up ES6 ISA? Let's start with the RAID one. RAID and NVMe is tough. Um, do you remember that um, Asus card, that consumer card for 70 80 dollars? That's not a RAID. It's just four individual M.2 drives passed through to the motherboard. You have to have bifurcation in your motherboard, and then it could just see four individual gumsticks. You VMFS format them separately, and that's it. That's not a RAID that VMware would like. So VMware would like something like an LSI RAID controller for the good days, good old days of SATA and SAS drives. Puts them all together in one pool, presents it as one thing that you can VMFS format. Great, and you're fully supported by VMware. And VMware, I've not cracked that nut. I even found like High Point or some company making an affordable solution, which will take four ridiculously fast M.2 drives and put them in like a, a RAID 0 or RAID 1 or RAID 5 or RAID 6 of those drives. I haven't found anything affordable. Um, so I'm just sticking with keeping it simple. And I went and bought myself the four terabyte um, Sabrent drive. And if I run out of space, I could be motion elsewhere to an eight terabyte if I had to, but I really tend to stick with M.2 for all my day-to-day -day production needs. So that's just me. 
So yeah, I really do try to keep my home life simple and stable. That doesn't mean I don't, I can't nest, right? If you want to do VMware Cloud Foundation or some giant project nested, what better way than have a stable underpinning of a fully supported, stable, and beefy system that has 120 gig of RAM in the future, going to the later ZNDs, you get all the way to 512 gig of RAM, starting to become important for people that do NSXT and VCF. Um, that's been my focus. Keep the physical lab simple and then do all kinds of nutty stuff in, in a nested situation. Um, okay, you also asked, what would you recommend for backing up ESXi running off SanDisk? Okay, let me, um, I still have that web page up. I'll just throw it in the chat, the answer. And before we close the Zoom, I should try to grab the chat because a lot of good stuff was set in here. And off, often, well, when you're not the leader on Zoom, it might be too late to grab it. So I'm just going to take a moment to put it in my clipboard now. Okay, cool. I got the chat. So there's your answer on the tool that I use, but it's on Windows. If someone has a Mac tool they use for imaging USB drives that have ESXi in them, great. Most tools break when they try when they see ESXi's weird formatting, including 7. They just have trouble. This is one I found that actually works. So if someone has a Mac equivalent, by all means, share it in the chat or unmute and tell us about it. That'd be awesome. All right. Um, so we've answered that. Yep. Okay. Um, for me particularly, I'm just using one VCSA host and all four of my nodes are in it, keeping it simple. But nothing keeps me from orphaning off a node like you saw me do at the beginning. I, I delete it from inventory. I could light up VCSA on that individual standalone node and join that node to that VCSA. Now, keep in mind with these days of certificates that can do goofy things to your Chrome certificates, say. Let's say I called it VCSA and had the same exact name I had and, now I'm and I changed DNS over. Well, guess what? Your Chrome is now really confused because I've downloaded certificates to my Windows machine, to my trusted root certificate store, and now I've hosed my ability to get into the VCSA I just built. So there's all sorts of stuff you can do to break yourself in a home lab with multiple VCSAs. But for me, back to you know simplicity, for most day-to-day -day operations, I just leave the one. Um, architecturally and how to do an enterprise, that's kind of a whole different topic. Yep, Denny. Yep, Denny at 352. Okay, 5018D is closer. Well, but it's still not the same model number. So if you were to try to call support and say it's close to the one that's on the list, it, it probably won't work. Um, I think it's the rack mount one, the 1U. So same motherboard, but I don't think it sold nearly as much as the mini tower. So I don't know if my impression, and I don't know much about the underpinnings of the, the money, but each system needs some real money to submit to that list. So Supermicro is going to pick and choose what's most popular probably on the older stuff. And unfortunately, they might, you know, unless they hear from you, people that own the older ones, like, again, I encourage you to contact them directly. Um, they might just let them go and encourage you to buy a newer one. And that's just, that's just the way it is. It's even that way with the big vendors. I'm not, it's not fair to single them out. Um, this is a, well, it's an age old problem in the IT industry. Yeah. Regardless of who you buy from, really. Every company's had black eyes at some point where, you know, if you orphan off in less than four or five years, you're in danger of irritating a lot of people. It does happen. Okay, next question was uh, DAC cables. Huh. Um, on this particular system, there is no SFP plus. So no, I haven't heard of issues of SFP plus ports dropping on the 10 gig on ZMD. So hopefully that answers Denny's question. It was only the RJ45 story I was telling there. Um, any other questions as we come to the three minutes left? If not, Al, I'll hand it back to you and as we close yeah, things out. Yep, if you don't mind, uh, and if any questions come in, I'll let you know. But in the meantime, if you want to uh, give control back to me so I can stop the uh, recording at the appropriate time. Uh, just a couple things to mention. Uh, sorry, folks, for the technical issues. Things happen. And uh, hopefully you take something from this uh, presentation. And uh, Paul's a great, wonderful resource in the community. And I'm sure he doesn't mind answering any questions once we're done here. But just as a reminder, and it's a limitation with the Zoom license that we've uh, been provided. Once, in this example, Paul becomes the presenter and or host, I cannot take back that permission or I cannot mute anybody moving forward until he gives that permission back to me. So that's, that, that explains a minor hiccup that we have. And additionally, if you enter the session after it's started, the rules that were in place to mute everybody upon entering the room don't apply to those folks that come in after the start time. So that's why there's a lot of open mics. That's why I'm afraid I had to interrupt Paul a few times just to uh, 
uh, have everyone muted out of respect for everybody's time and effort. That's all, no big deal. And lastly, Paul, thank you again for everything. Uh, can't thank you enough for uh, your efforts in the community, sharing your knowledge, documenting everything. I can speak for myself. I've used Paul's websites, his articles, and they've come in extremely handy in my brief time, you know, when I get some time to use my home lab, uh, but he's a wonderful resource and a good man as well. So with that being said, Paul, if you have any uh, words to uh, finish it up, you're more than welcome to. Well, back at you and everything you said. Uh, I can't believe how uh, fortunate I am to have met you in person multiple occasions and talked about life. And it means a lot to me and, and career. And that's what we all need, <laughs> especially right now. Um, and I really appreciate you giving me a chance to speak to a new group of folks that I hadn't met before. So thank no you. Pleasure. No pleasure. Uh, with that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording.